Welcome everyone to athens Clark County Community Conversation. Uh, we are coming to you every Wednesday from 6 to 7 with information and support updates uh, from athens Clark County, our residents and many of our partners uh, in this challenging pandemic crisis time. Uh, we understand that the more information you have, the, the more reassurance you have, and the better we are all able to hold together through this. Um, we've got a fantastic show tonight with uh, a handful of guests. Um, first up, we're going to have uh, Michelle Pearson and Tim Kelly as small business people talk a little bit about their experiences. And that business perspective is really going to be what ties tonight together. Uh, after talking with Michelle and Tim, uh, we're going to move on to first David Bradley, who's CEO of the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce, to provide some information about how small business people can gain some support here in Athens. And then we're going to talk to Ridge McClanahan, who's with First American Bank, who can talk about how if you want to prepare yourself ideally for some of the packages that are available, you can gather your documents and put yourself in the best position possible. And then in the last half of the hour, um, Commissioner Mariah Parker is joining us, who's going to bring your questions uh, that you've been submitting over the last week. Um, at the front end of the program, I also want to note, um, next week, we plan on having somebody from the G Georgia Department of Labor join us for those individual employee needs. So as you continue to submit questions through the portal at accgov.com slash mayor, again, that's accgov.com slash mayor, um, please let us know if you've got some of those individual employee related kinds of questions as we can have somebody from the Department of Labor field those. So um, we are coming to you here on YouTube, on Facebook, and on WGAU FM and AM radio. And I'm really glad to kick off today with a longtime friend of mine, Michelle Pearson. Um, Michelle, so you are uh, an investment professional with Edward Jones and um, also work with the Northeast Georgia Business Alliance. And so I wanted to have both you and Tim on in a couple of minutes to just talk about what you're seeing kind of on the ground level. Um, so, Michelle, uh, I, I guess first let everybody know a little bit about Northeast Georgia Business Alliance and then about the work you do at Edward Jones. And then tell me what your experiences have been so far. Will do. Um, again, I'm Michelle Pearson, and I am the co-founder and vice chair with the Northeast Georgia Business Alliance. We are an organization um, that's designed around helping um, predominantly African-American businesses, um, community relationship, um, nonprofits, churches, and so forth. Um, actually look at procurement opportunities and become a sustainable business in our community um, in whatever shape, form, or fashion they choose to grow into. Um, and so we've been in existence since 2017. Um, we launched Black History Month in 2017. And since then, um, we have always say we have 30, and David, you can probably relate to this, we have 30 core active people who are working, but a network of 300 um, to provide educational opportunities and resources um, especially around administrative and educational side of things when it comes to how do you grow your business. Um, with that particular group, um, what we've been seeing, because we have a broad spectrum of business professionals, um, and when I say that, I'm saying everything from the healthcare industry when it comes to um, dental services and um, mental health with therapy. So we have a broad spectrum on that end. But we also have a lot of small businesses that are in the restaurant industry, catering. Um, I myself am in the financial industry hair care, churches, so very broad spectrum, and we're seeing things across the board. Um, people are coming back with a lot of needs because like most of us, we've had to pivot how we do business. Um, and some of that's really been designed around not having the network to reach out as contracts are coming down and people are having different needs or specialty needs that have not typically been asked for. Um, and so as people can pivot their business, we're struggling um, with finding how do we connect them with the resources for larger industries that need those resources. So that's one hand that I live on um, for myself personally in the financial industry because um, we've been essential and working through this um, pandemic. What we've had the experience of is how do we network and connect with our clients? So we do mostly on the phone, web conferencing, very similar to what we're doing now. But of course, as a financial advisor, having a large population um, of my clients who are older, 
So it's been a lot of training on how do we use these um, resources and technology um, on one hand, but for a lot of my small business owners, it's actually been much more convenient because they don't have to pull away, especially as they are trying to do this pivot. So we're seeing a, a broad spectrum of things. Great. That's that's interesting, Michelle. Now, I, I mean, I think everybody who's broadly aware of the dynamics of kind of American business culture, you know, have heard the notion that, you know, a lot of African-American businesses uh, may not be banked in the traditional way that, um, you know, that larger scale businesses are. Uh, are you finding uh, member clients and partners who are particularly struggling given this crisis and not having those traditional banking industry ties? We are seeing a good bit of that, um, probably more so in the resource because a lot of the relationships that um, some of my other business owners have with their bankers, that doesn't exist um, as much in the African-American community. And so what we're finding is that when they're calling for help and how do I do fill in the blank, the business alliance, we've kind of become that fill in the blank, that backdoor administrative side of things and utilizing and leveraging our relationships with folks to put those phone calls in, um, helping out just fill out applications and getting paperwork submitted. Um, so we're seeing that on one hand. Also, when you think about a lot of the documentation that the banks are asking for requiring just simple, um, you know, P&L, uh, profit and loss statements, small businesses, a lot of times they aren't doing that legwork on the front end. Um, they're waiting until I, I have to have it. And with limited resources um, and folks that would traditionally be doing that work not being readily available, we're having, they're having a hard time. And so, again, the Business Alliance, we are backfilling a lot of those resources We've actually been doing a lot of Zoom calls um, in regards to um, like a money smart program and things like that that the FDIC offer we offers. We've been hosting those sessions and educational seminars during this time as well. We we'll probably do about three or four a week. Not doing things on the front end. That sounds like me doing my taxes every year where I just have this big box of crap that eventually I've got to sort through and uh, and get ready. And, and, and now I've got a couple more months. So uh, uh, <laughs> go, go, go timeline extension. Um, Michelle, I'll say in my role as mayor, one of the things that uh, you know I have the benefit of attempting to do is uh, communicate with federal authorities. And I will say, you know, for for all of our representatives, their offices have been great in terms of outreach. And I've got relationships with somebody in in every one of the congressional offices that represent us. Is there any message that you would have me deliver? based on your experience or maybe the experience of, of your partners, either when it comes to the, um, the way the, the federal websites have been set up, the way the systems are arranged? Yeah, a couple of things that um, I would probably highlight in that space, um, especially when you're talking about um, funding and financing. Um, as you know, just across like the rest of the country, um, when funding came down the first round, people who needed it the most, especially your 1099 employees, um, those small business owners, sole proprietorships, they were not the ones who received the funding. Um, when I think about our membership makeup, so many of them who run their own business, the hair salons and the barbershops that were completely closed, they had zero income coming in and no way to then backfill and take care of their family. Their spouse, um, in most cases, the spouses are working. Um, however, that sometimes mean that that spouse is working at a lower rate just because African-Americans traditionally are paid lower. Um, amount. So they, they're struggling on that front. But then also their spouses a lot of times are having to be in the service industry. So they're the ones going into our healthcare facilities. They're the ones that are going and stocking the grocery stores in the space. And then, which leads to my second thing, from a healthcare concern, they don't have access to that. So between the healthcare and lack of wages and access to funding, that's where we're hearing the screaming from our members that we're trying to figure out what's next. How do we help and fill in those gaps? Uh, that's that's helpful, Michelle. I mean, one of the things I've noted is that um, this pandemic certainly demonstrates to us how important those foundational employment and healthcare resources are. And the stronger the foundation, the stronger we are as a community. Um, but but that particularly falls, I think, as you note, on certain business classes and you know communities of color, you know, who don't have as much access to kind of high wage positions and, and, and to healthcare certainly in, in this region of the country. Yeah, so. even telemental health, I think, is one thing that's a big concern because um, with all this, people who may have some access to may not want to actually go into a facility, rightfully so in this environment. Um, but telemental health is one of those things that's on the chopping block. So what do I do now? And I'm saying that even more from physically, but also the mental standpoint, because this is an emotionally hard time for so many people 
that are there's an increased service when we're talking about how do I do counseling just because I'm depressed now because of all these other factors that may or may not have access to it. So we're hearing those, those conversations happen around um, our water cooler as well. Uh, I'm sure. And, and, you know, it's crazy, you know, somebody who's availed himself of uh, mental health resources and counseling resources in the past, you know, if you're accustomed to doing that live in person and you're, you know, literally sitting on the couch, you know, it may not be so difficult to think about transitioning to the Zoom with your counselor, but it probably would be a whole different thing to think your first counseling appointment in your life would be a, a digital activity. Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, we, like I said, we're seeing a broad spectrum and we, what we are really struggling with is then how do we backfill that? How do we get the resources to folks and how do we get them connected to the resources? Because so many of our businesses are resilient that they have it, they can easily pivot and they are pivoting very well. They just may not have that connection, the resource when we're talking about what the county or the school district or the hospitals or larger employers in our areas may need um, from a nuanced environment that we're in. And how do they know that, hey, my small business may offer that. So That's great. Well, Michelle, I appreciate you coming on and just sharing some of the perspective that you're experiencing out there on the street. Okay. Um, and speaking to the street, um, we have uh, with us Tim Kelly next. Um, uh, Tim runs uh, uh, with his wife, uh, Rook and Pawn, a uh, great business here on Washington Street in Athens, and is also one of the partners in the National. Um, Tim, you did not begin uh, your professional life in Athens as a small business owner, did you? No, I did not. I um, I started at the um, office. Of, I was an attorney in the Office of Legal Affairs at the University of Georgia um, after graduating from UJ undergrad and uh, UJ Law School. And then, um, yeah, we took the plunge about five it's five years ago. It would have been the it will be the five year anniversary of the Rook and Pond in June. So congratulations. Um, yeah, thank you. And of course, we want to make sure that that you survive past your fifth anniversary so or to um, it, yeah <laughs> yeah to it at, at the minimum to it and and hopefully beyond um one of the things that prompted me to give you a call and ask if you'd be willing to come on was that you, you wrote this great blog piece about a week ago for uh, the sports writer will leach's blog um uh, that, that he's keeping in the midst of this pandemic uh waiting for superman just about your day by day week by week blow by blow experience as a small business owner so, Tim, can you share with us a little bit about what you shared in the blog and kind of what your what your challenges have been? Sure. Um, and let me say I was very grateful for Will to give me that opportunity because I thought, um, you know, it might be useful to hear everyone has you know, read the stories about, you know, the relief being passed and, um, you know, the, uh, you know, each day comes some, with some new news. But to actually hear how that was in, you know, implemented on, on the ground every day. And sort of the challenges we faced. Um, so I sort of, you know, I feel like um, there's been three big stages to this ordeal. Uh, we started sort of at the beginning, and then we moved on to like sort of the relief phase, and then um, now we're in the in the reopen Georgia phase. And so, um, I, sort of in the beginning, I think the, it was all about fear and sort of frustration as a small business owner. Um, we were operating with very limited data, very limited understanding of what was happening. It happened so fast. I mean, we were, you know, people were out on spring break and um, we all knew about the virus. We knew it was, you know, at the seriousness of it. And we, um, you know, it all kind of hit, hit ahead on that Wednesday of when like the NBA was canceled. And now, you know, this was getting canceled and Tom Hanks had it. And you know, there was, um, and, and so it accelerated so rapidly. And so we were put in a position where um, we were sort of forced to make these decisions and sort of be like epidemiologists and labor attorneys and, you know, all all in one day. Um, you know, we stay open and we sort of we would risk the health of our employees, our customers, um, you know, and the and the rightful sort of backlash of, you know, the out in social media of, of you know, the irresponsibility stay, staying open or we close without knowing what happens to our employees. You know, will there be unemployment? Will there be something for them to fall back on? And so, you know, that that was just each day was just, um, you know, those frustrations were you know, very stressful. But then now along comes the relief. And so, you know, a lot of well-intentioned relief out there, the, you know, the PPP, the unemployment benefit, the, you know, the SBA um, EIDL grant that was, that was available. Um, but now as that started coming out, then we started to see how there wasn't really a plan behind all that. And then 
And so in implementation, um, not, not, not even to speak of sort of the issues that we had to face going through the application process, as Michelle talked about that, um, you know, how the rush to get the funding through the PPP or you know, the challenges we face just even logging on to certain websites, logging on to the DOL, DOL website to get unemployment, you know, for our employees. Um, so, um, but then, you know, after we do that, after you're able to navigate all that, um, what does that relief look like? So we have the Paycheck Protection Program, which at the time, you know, as it was being passed, was it was lauded as this, you know, this is a great pool of funds, um, you know, and I, most of the in, indication was that providing you bring your employees back, you know, June, um, you know, that you bring them back up to payroll, um, that this is going to be a forgivable loan. And that's, that's, that's great. That sounds great. Um, but then as guidance comes out, now it's a little bit different. So now, you know, 75% of that absolutely has to be spent on payroll within the next eight weeks. And so what does that look like for a business that is effectively closed? And how do you bring, you know, your eight FTEs or your nine employees back to a business that's shuttered or is only doing like what we're doing, a very limited takeout and, you know, coffee operation? Um, what does that mean for their very generous the un unemployment benefits right now how does you know how do we balance those out if they come back do they lose those benefits um you know and then you know there's advocation for uh you know rent abatement and that was great rent deferrals but now you know george is back open up again and so you know you you sort of undercut you know that argument so there was all this constant um you know this constant battle between the relief and so it just appeared that uh the relief that was passed through the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, and some others, um, while well intentioned, was probably not designed for what we what we think of as small businesses when you're driving down, you know, through downtown in Athens. Um, and so maybe, you know, in the end, it's great to see some of these companies, you know, giving back some of that money. But maybe in the first place, we shouldn't have been in the same pool as the Los Angeles Lakers. You know, there should have been more directed relief. Um, for restaurants, for bars, for you know, small retail operations that we see. You, downtown. you can't even field two teams from your employees on the uh, on the court. <laughs> That's true, right? Exactly. I don't know how. Yeah, how can we compete? Um, so and so that moves us into sort of the the, the next phase, this last of the current phase, the reopen Georgia phase, um, where we um, you know now we're allowed you know to to open back up again, and it just very much feels like I'm back on March 16th again. It's uh, you know we're um, we're given the opportunity to open up, but what does that look like? If we open up, what sort of backlash do we face? You know, what sort of health health risks are we, um, you know, Im imposing on our employees and our customers? Um, and then it now comes with all the new challenges of, you know, here's a 39 point plan for restaurants that if you do open up, that you have to follow. Uh, you know, you have limited capacity, but your rent is the same, your overheads are the same, the utilities are the same. So that's it's just it's more sort of relief. Um, in uh, in a way that's not um, you know it's not efficient. It's not meant for um, the small business. Uh, so that's where we are right now. But um, uh, hearing Michelle talk um, brings me sort of to the last point, and that it's not. Uh, I've been so encouraged, and so um, it's been so amazing to see what people in Athens you know have been doing. Uh, and I just want to just say thank you to all of the customers and the and the patrons that have come. Um, either to the Rook and Pond, to the National, um, and talking with, you know, Peter and Aaron over the National this week, they were saying that, you know, they've seen so many of the familiar faces, but they've seen so many new faces um, to come uh, when they're doing their takeout on Thursday through Saturday. Um, people have been, you know, bending over backwards to find ways to support the businesses that, that they love. Um, and that it's been great to see how quick, as you know, Michelle's pointed out, that um, how quick the businesses have been able to pivot and change their model in literally a day, you know, it's, you know, there, you know, there's you know, businesses that were a restaurant, but now we're doing, we have an online, you know, retail sales, you know, component and that got put together in the course of hours. And so it's been really great to see that sort of um, ingenuity and innovation from the owners as well. As a near neighbor of the national, I was glad to see them reopen, if only because my homemade burritos were getting a little bit stale. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's only so much you can do with a, a tortilla and a microwave. That's right. So, um, Tim, I guess, sort of thinking about the same version of the question I asked Michelle a couple of minutes ago, um, if you wanted me to carry some specific kinds of requests to the federal government as they continue to finesse these programs, I mean, certainly you reference this large variation in scale between uh, a variety of entities that were supposedly supposed to feed into the same system. 
what, what else would you offer me? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just hammer home the point that um, that while the relief has been you know useful and great for so many people, um, without real targeted relief for restaurants, service industries, the, um, relief that they can practically use, whether that's rent abatement or um, a way that we could actually use funds and have loans forgiven that makes sense for places that are still closed and rightfully you know, should be closed. Um, I think, you know, downtown, I think is going to look a whole lot different in a year if we don't you know, see something like that. Absolutely. Um, well, Tim, I appreciate you sharing your story. Michelle, absolutely the same. Um, we're going to turn just a moment to David Bradley, CEO of the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce, um, because um, what I think Tim noted has been amazing about Athens is everybody's ability to come together and even given the limitations of some of the program offerings to be able to hold each other's hands and hang hang on to each other i mean figuratively and literally to make sure we make it through this so um david if you could talk a little bit about some of those supports that that have been stood up here in athens and how people can best access them yeah, thanks, Mayor. Uh, and Tim, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that we actually were have, have some of our best friends coming down from North Carolina. They were planning on coming down this weekend. And our first stop always when they get in is the Rook and Pawn. Oh, so I just got off the phone with them prior to getting on. They made sure to say hello, and they're going to spend a whole lot of money as soon as you do open up. <laughs> well, fantastic. I hope they're still playing games. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, Mayor, it's just simply uh, just a sort of put a little bit of perspective in there. You, we might know that the Chamber is a, is a membership-based organization that strives to help build economic prosperity throughout the community. So we now have over 800 members of the Chamber that provide our organization financial support in many respects. Uh, so we started out this year, we developed a very aggressive plan of work for 2020 that was focused on growing the economy, growing prosperity for all Athenians, and growing the chamber. And Tim, as you noted, I think it was maybe March 12th or March 13th, everything changed. When COVID-19 hit, uh, we, the, the organizationally, we had to completely change our focus. And, uh, you know, we've, we, I, I dare say membership has not been a word that has been used around our organization for probably six weeks or so. Uh, we decided that we wanted to be the dis we needed to be the disseminator of fact based information to the business community. Uh, that we wanted to entertain any ideas and strategies to help minimize as any way that we could minimize the negative economic impact on all Athens businesses. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that the business community had a voice in uh, local decision making. Uh, we've worked. Really, we've tried to work seamlessly with a wide range of partners, and I can't thank Michelle and the Northeast Georgia Business Alliance enough. Envision Athens, Clark County School District, the and certainly the Office of Economic Development of Athens, Clark County. Uh, we've also we recognize too that we have to be we are the uh, Athens is the commercial hub of Northeast Georgia, so we have convened probably seven or eight regional meetings with other chambers throughout the North, Northeast Georgia region to, uh, you know, sometimes to cry on each other's shoulders, but oftentimes to talk about best practices. So and as we all said, uh, uh, Kelly, needless to say, I mean, we are truly, we are in unprecedented times and the livelihood of many Athenians is challenged. Um, so never before has the business community the employing component of our community been challenged with the degree of immediacy like we felt like in the last in COVID-19. Uh, and as, as Tim had noted, the, uh, or as everybody had noted, the, uh, it, it is, I think it's important to note that the enormity of the relief from the federal government has, has been staggering. Uh, I mean, the size of the relief is is staggering and the immediacy of which that has gotten to us has been staggering but it's also had some pitfalls some problems as we know as we've talked about it's it's come across so quickly that probably less fully uh been able to be fully thought out and vetted uh, 
So I'm, and I'm, uh, so what I'd love to do, Kelly, if it's okay to buy you is, uh, I mean, I, I we can, I can actually share the screen. Um, so what I, what I, what I'd love to do, it'd be to let Rhodes McClanahan with First American Bank Rhodes, if can you talk a little bit about the whole, uh, paycheck, uh, the, the, uh, the, the whole PPP process and what that's been like for you and for your fellow financial uh, institutions? Sure. Um, I'm glad Tim went first. Uh, he <laughs> kind of went through the, the range of emotions that we're seeing from applicants uh, every single day. And that is that they are worried about their business, rightfully so, with everything shut down. Uh, they were certainly excited about the prospects of the Paycheck Protection Program that was authorized under the under the CARE, CARES Act. Excuse me. Uh, they were certainly anxious, as uh, I think Tim uh, mentioned. It's, it, unfortunately, it was a first come first serve program, uh, so there was certainly a um, a premium placed on how quickly you could get your information together. Um, Michelle actually mentioned independent contractors, you know, the, the, the small businesses being left out, which they, which they were. In fact, the small businesses, the, those independent contractors, the 1099 workers weren't able to uh, submit their applications. Banks weren't able to submit the applications uh, until a, a full week after um, we started processing the others. Uh, their applications are more complicated. Uh, they're, they're more... Uh, moving parts. It's not as easy as a, a, a W-3 or a 941 uh, request to a, a larger business. Um, I think that, and you know, I'm going to continue because Tim, you, you did a great job of kind of talking through some of the, the challenges. Um, from a banking perspective, this is something that was rolled out in a week. Uh, it was put onto a platform that was not meant to uh, process um, hundreds of thousands of, of transactions. Uh, there's been, you know, our folks have done an amazing job, many of them working from, from home to process transactions throughout all hours of the day. Uh, I'm proud to say that we've, as of this afternoon, before we got on the call, we had processed our, our very last uh, application that we, we received. And those applications, you know, I think our smallest loan was about $600. So they, you know, we, we are being able to uh, provide funds to uh, to businesses, in, you know, varying in sizes. Um, you walk around Athens, and there's there are a lot of businesses that uh, that you could point to that uh, that I, you know, that First American Bank as well as the other you know, banks in town have been able to help. But um, it it has been um, a program where there was very little guidance up front. Um, I keep pointing people to the, the Treasury, United States Treasury website, because if you go to that link, the information that's on that site is, is every bit of information that banks have to process these applications, that borrowers have, you know, as a resource uh, in terms of, you know, how do I apply, you know, what does the forgiveness look like? And this is, this is you know, Tim, you had mentioned the forgiveness. That's the elephant in the room, um, and that's, you know, Kelly, you had mentioned, you know, what is it that, that I can take to, you know, to, to um, folks in the federal government to, to help, you know, small businesses? And I think relaxing the forgiveness portion of this program is, is, would be a tremendous help. Uh, the funds are, are going to, you know, the employees uh, of, of these small businesses. Um, but as Tim mentioned, um, you know, the, the employees are actually weighing you know, the benefits of what they would get through you know, payment from their employer versus what they're getting um, not having to, to uh, come into to work during this time. So it's, it's just, there, there's just been a lot of moving parts that I don't, you know, I don't know that anybody thought through everything um, as, in terms of, of getting something $650 billion out uh, to employees of, of small businesses in such a short period of time. Um, and it is, as I mentioned before, it's, it's continuing to change. The, the, the good news is that these applications are being processed. Um, 
there's a lot of money that has been dispersed uh, by local banks into our community. And just in um, your institution. I'm oh, sorry. And just in your institution, I think you mentioned in an earlier call that I was on with you, many hundreds of these. Right. We, we've processed over 500, uh, over $50 million um, as, of, as of this afternoon. Um, and, you know, once again, I'm, I'm just a little bit worried about the forgiveness piece on the, on the back end. And I know that there's going to be guidance coming out you know, to help businesses navigate uh, that process. Um, but overall, I think it's remarkable that we've been able to accomplish what we have uh, in such a short period of time. And Kelly, uh, in, uh, as a credit to you and in conversations I think you probably had with the commission and uh, with uh, John Williams and WNA Engineering, there's, uh, there was a, there's, there's probably a, a, a significant number of, of businesses within the community that did not have a relationship with an existing bank who could provide uh, paycheck protection program, uh, you know, because initially when the when the money was initial, the first funding of, uh, of the first series of of monies that that came out, those those funds were available to SBA lending institutions. So if your institution was not an SBA lender, you might not have access to that. Uh, so as a result of your conversations, we were able to pull together a community bank entrepreneurial collective. Uh, we had nine uh, local financial institutions, uh, and like First American with Rhodes, and Rhodes said that he would he would try to get through as best he could at up to ten non-customers through on the the uh, community bank entrepreneurial collective. Provided we just did some very very basic vetting so that we could provide Rhodes and the other eight institutions as much information as we could. Uh, and today, you know, we've we've gotten 27 people, our 27 businesses through that portal, and we still have an opportunity to get a few more as the money as the money is available. So, David, if if I'm a small business owner and I don't have a relationship with one of those SBA lending institutions, um, should I contact the yeah. Athens Area Chamber of Commerce as my kind of first point of entry? Please contact me at david.bradley at athensga.com. Uh, and uh, we can we'll, we'll get you connected. It's we've been able to get people connected within thirty minutes of sending in of of filling out this very simple Google Doc. Uh, it's also important to note uh, that, that I mean there are two there are two pots of money that that have become available or that started out to be available. Uh, one was through the SBA, and as Tim had noted earlier, that's an economic injury disaster loan and loan advance. Those funds dried up pretty quickly, but in the most recent uh, or the second uh, provision of funding, they received an additional $60 billion. Uh, those monies from the economic, uh, the EIDL, you know, they're available through, you have to fill out the application through the SBA.gov. So those monies are available. You've got to fill it out online. Uh, many people, initially the, the loan at component of the economic injury disaster loan. Initially, again, as Tim had noted earlier, it's, there's been a lot of moving targets. Uh, the initial suggestion was that uh, if you requested an advance, you'd get 10, that your business would get ten thousand uh, dollars, and it would be in your pocket. Uh, three days. Days. Uh, so three or four days later, they came back to say, no, that's actually a thousand. It's going to be a thousand dollars per employee with a maximum of ten thousand dollars. To be honest with you, I didn't know too many people in three weeks. I didn't know too many businesses that have had, had received their their, uh, their check. Uh, this week, though, I've talked to many businesses that have received them their loan advance. Again, that's money that does not necessarily require, does not necessarily need to be back. Uh, so the, the SBA.gov, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan is available through SBA.gov and the pay, payroll, prote uh, the Paycheck Protection Plan is available through local banks. Uh, in, in just as, as you had noted, somebody had noted earlier, and I'm sure that we may have some other questions for Rhodes, but I just want to make sure that we talk about uh, a unique uh, 
uh, opportunity to that for local business leaders to it doesn't have to be a business leader, but these are stressful times. Uh, we had a telephone conversation with Dean Cheyette at the School of Social Work, uh, and we've developed uh, some uh, programming to help people get through the stress, uh, to get through some of the stressful times. Uh, some of that information, a lot of that information. It's available on our website at uh, www.athensga.com and at the uh, COVID-19 tag. Uh, and we're also having some periodic um, uh, video conferences just to, to let people unload a little bit. And it's pretty valuable. So. Great. Thank you, David. Um, Rhodes, I, I think I, I heard you mention uh, in an earlier call um, that you had some anticipation about when the current round of funding would dry up. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about if I'm a business and I want to get my documents in order, what do I need to do tonight and how quickly do I need to act? That's a good question. It's, it's one where I don't really know the, the answer. As of yesterday, I believe at noon, uh, there are 50 billion of the, the new round of around 320 uh, had been spoken for. The, the good news in, in this round is the, the loan amounts are much smaller. So the, the loan amounts across the board are much smaller because the unfortunately the larger uh, companies were uh, processed in that first round. So I would think that um, certainly in the next day or so, I would want to make sure I got my application in. Um, I spoke to uh, a, a small business that couldn't get it or they didn't know what the status of theirs was. Uh, they just said that they were in a queue and I told them that I would help them out. We we're able to process these applications in five minutes now. Um, so they've worked out a lot of the systems uh, issues, but it, they just need to be able to pull that information together probably by the end of tomorrow uh, to be safe. And um, we'll have an update most likely later on tonight in terms of exactly what the status uh, of the the funds remaining is. So clearly time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, Rhodes, I really appreciate you coming on to explain process-wise uh, how important it is that people act quickly. And I, I thank you for being part of that consortium that David mentioned of several local lending institutions that were willing to take on a handful of folks who, who weren't otherwise your customers. Uh, it's meaningful and, and we appreciate your work as a community member. Um, David, uh, the chamber also, and I want to give you a chance to plug the partnership that you've stood up with Envision Athens um, to, to help funds go a little bit further in the community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, oh, gosh, Kelly, or, or, uh, I'm not sure which which one we're, we, we partner so much with Envision Athens. Help me out. Oh, I, I'm sorry. The um, the the um, the, uh, the Athens Reinvestment Program, uh, such that businesses oh, are Athens supporting work. Look, Athens, works. Athens works. Oh, absolutely. Gosh, I'm so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, we uh, there are a number of organiz and there are a number of businesses that uh, that are that are continuing to operate. You know, if you look at landscapers or arborists or or uh, you know. For all practical purposes, businesses are continuing to operate in maybe full scale or half scale or or what have you. We've uh, Athens Works initiative was is an uh, an initiative that was developed between Envision Athens and the Chamber and uh, was in some degree the brainchild of Kevin Hammond at New Urban Forestry to try to get folks that are currently working there where they're working their staff to take the pledge to absolutely very intentionally support Athens businesses and particularly restaurants. Uh, so there uh, we have, I think there might be 35 to 40 businesses that have taken the pledge. It's not being managed and administered. That's not the intent of the program, but they've taken the pledge to uh, spend at least $10 per employee uh, per day buying food from local restaurants. Uh, we don't, and so it's it's really been very cool to see people jump on ship and uh, take the pledge to support this this extraordinary community through Athens Works Initiative. 
Uh, and it is available. In, information on Athens Works uh, is at AthensWorksInitiative.com. Great. Great. Thanks, David. Um, Rhodes, uh, before we uh, get into the question and answer portion of the evening, um, I, I did have something uh, from staff here asking if um, your, um, your recommendations on payroll protection also apply to EIDL. Um, do, do you see those funds kind of moving on a parallel track? Uh, as David mentioned, those EIDL um, funds are, are starting to be distributed this week. Um, the I, I just know that the the you can't use the funds in the same way. So you can you can have the EIDL as well as the, the payroll protection, and certainly encourage people uh, to if if they're eligible for an additional amount under payroll protection to certainly apply, regardless of what that amount is. I mean, every every dollar. Uh, counts, um, but they kind of work parallel with with each other. You're just not able to use the proceeds in the same way. So those those uh, if you received two thousand dollars in in EIDL, you can't count uh, payroll that's spent under the pay paycheck uh, protection, the PPP loan. Uh, you can't count that two thousand dollars that you paid your employee uh, since you you received that under the the forgivable grant um, with EIDL. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, we are now going to transition into the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, certainly some questions related to the business supports that we've had a chance to talk about for the bulk of the program. Um, but I know we've got questions about another a variety of matters as well. Um, and as I mentioned, in our next program a week from tonight, we will have somebody from the Georgia Department of Labor who is with us. So if you do have some specific individual labor-related questions, um, we'll go ahead and handle those when we've got somebody expert in those matters uh, here on the program with us. So, um, uh, Commissioner Mariah Parker, good evening. You're still muted, but I'm going to unmute you. Oh, yeah. Ta-da! There we go. It's like Fabulous. the center square on uh, coronavirus bingo. Someone's yeah. going to be muted in your conference call. Um, so, our first question comes from Kim Nagalong who asks, how do we keep up to date with the Winterville loan application process? I think she's referring to the process, the um, authority, the joint authority with the city of Winterville and athens Park County that we uh, formalized last week. That's right. So um, in terms of moving forward with our ability to provide some uh, no interest loans to small businesses with local dollars, uh, last week, the athens Park County Mayor and Commission approved this new joint development authority, which will be an ongoing standing local governmental authority, but um, was really created um, with the immediate need of being able to, to loan some funds to businesses. The Winterville mayor and council acted unanimously here on Monday, just two days ago. Um, if you go up to accgov.com, you'll find an application for three athens Clark County resident positions on that authority board. So we're gonna get those uh, authority board members in place in the next week. And then we anticipate the following week, so essentially two weeks from now, uh, local business loans available. And uh, so we're, we're moving as quickly as we can. And, and what I'm going to be recommending to the commission is that we initially stock that loan fund with a million dollars of the, the local dollars that we had set aside for community relief uh, across all sectors. All right. Thanks. Our next question comes from Allie Miller. As a small business owner who is trying to keep people in our community safe by currently remaining closed, can we expect guidance from the city on when it will be safe or safer to reopen? Thank you. Um, so um, for, for Allie, you know, I've, I've been explicit in saying that, you know, as I listen to national epidemiologists and those who are conscious of um, the rates of infection, you know, we're, we're clearly not out of the woods yet. And, um, you know, the current arc of activity looks like we may have reached uh, at least a plateau, if not a peak, um, and certainly we would hope to see some decline. And at least in um, the advice of those healthcare professionals, again, kind of wiser and more scientifically minded than myself, um, I think many of them would suggest that we need to see two consistent weeks of decline in new cases sort of before the first round of, of business openings. Um, and so I, I would absolutely recommend continuing to pay attention to, to those metrics. Um, Johns Hopkins uh, runs a, a 
well-regarded website that provides some information on a state-by-state -state basis. And so I would refer you to that resource. All right. Our next question comes from Nancy Goodrich, who, referring to the data from the Northeast Georgia Health District, um, would love for us to explain the ongoing shelter in place effectiveness and discussion related to extending. Additionally, rather than address the possible extension of shelter in place as a countywide endeavor, is the county planning on focusing on local hotspots to reduce the spread? And lastly, how does this impact the economic plans and budget for the county in light of change of re changes in revenues? I'd be happy to reread those three parts in a second, but no, that's uh, that, that's okay. I, I think I can do them in reverse order. So, All right. uh, just this late afternoon, um, my draft of the budget was delivered to the county commissioners. Uh, it contemplates a, a, a very small reduction in um, in the millage rate to provide some relief. A reduction in alcohol licensing fees and also a reduction in water and sewer rates um, to support individuals. Um, but given that there is so much fog about what the next six weeks, six months, and even 18 months may look like, um, I've retained almost two months of reserve revenue um, in case things get very difficult and we see some enormous reduction in, in revenue, you know, say if uh, sales tax revenue declines dramatically. So um, the public will be, the budget, excuse me, will be uh, public uh, tomorrow evening. And so uh, I encourage everybody to go take a look at that. Um, on the question of very localized hotspots, um, one of the dynamics that's important to know about athens Clark County is just the daily in-migration and out-migration that happens. So uh, a little more than 40,000 people under normal circumstances come into Athens every day for work, and just under 40,000 people leave Athens every day for work. And so if we all existed in these micro pods that were neighborhood sized, it might be possible to say address the corner of North Avenue and First Street or the corner of Millage and Lumpkin, but simply given the dynamics of even occupational travel through and throughout this community and, and to our neighbors and from our neighbors, um, we we can't effectively have sort of that scale of, of shutdown, which is why a lot of the conversation in public health quarters has been around statewide dynamics rather than even uh, localized dynamics. And okay. I, I think there, was, there, there may have been a third piece that I... No, that's that's of, actually everything. I think that the okay. first piece was sort of pre, as a preamble to those latter okay. two, so I think you covered everything. Um, from Brent Plagenhoff, I run a restaurant and was of the understanding that we were not allowed to sell liquor to go, yet I've seen at least two rest restaurants advertising liquor to, to go liquor drinks. We as a business are struggling and doing what we can to get by. Selling liquor would be helpful, but we are following the law, not doing it, but the playing field needs to be level. So I'm wondering if we can sell liquor to go or, and if not, then these other places need to stop. Again, level playing field. Thank you. No, so the, you want uh, to address uh, this question of to go liquor drinks? I, I do prefer the level playing field. And so um, to that end, um, let me be very clear. No, athens Clark County does not allow liquor to go. Uh, bottle of wine, yes. Um, sealed beer, yes. A growler even, yes. Um, but no, you got to get your hooch on somewhere else. And, uh, and, and I do understand that there are a couple of local governments in the state uh, that have gotten just different legal guidance than we've gotten. And that's in, in some ways the nature of uh, how attorneys work. But, you know, our, our our legal guidance has been very clear. No, we are not permitted under the umbrella of state law um, to um, to have that Singapore sling that walks out the door with you. And uh, if you do find somebody who's in that position, um, if you would just visit accgov.com slash coronavirus, there is a place to report uh, community needs of all sort related to this. And if you would report those places, we could help out. All right. Um, Selena uh, Vatithil asks, what is the best way for us to donate to support local businesses? Is there a fund to which we can contribute? Are there other local funds that we should know about? Um, David, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and shoot that over to you. If, if somebody's looking for some uh, provision to local businesses, what would you recommend? Yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, there is a there's an Athens tip jar that is available to 
uh, and I don't have that that contact information, but that largely is going to help support those that have been in the hospitality industry, bartenders and uh, wait staff. Uh, on the Athens area community, the Athens area Community Foundation has done a magnificent job in trying to pivot. Uh, and actually on uh, the Athens area cf.org website, uh, they have developed a, um, a, a fund to, to help support local nonprofits. Um, I would suggest for there, there's not a there's not a fund set aside specifically for Athens area businesses yet. Uh, my suggestion is support them in every way, shape, or form. Don't, and particularly with restaurants, don't hesitate to order food for yourself, for your family. Try to try to utilize your, you know, if you if you can utilize your stimulus check to help support the local economy by shopping locally in every way possible. Great, thanks, David. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think this next question goes back to some of what we were talking about earlier about how to report. Um, businesses that might not be in compliance with the um, the recommended shelter in place, but um, Benjamin Britton asks the work workers at Pilgrims Pride are being pressured to work while sick. At Pilgrims, they have a point system where employees collect five points. If cl employees collect five points, they'll be fired. Management has told employees that being so sick they vomit while on the line is not a valid excuse to be released from work for the day. Essentially, threatening employees that they will be receive a point if they leave work due to illness. What is the city and state doing to safeguard the rights of these workers and prevent community spread at this vulnerable workplace? Great. Um, as people have watched the national news and, and even around the state, they've seen a number of um, kind of meatpacking facilities or comparable employers that, that have been the uh, the site of a, a lot of spread. And so that, that's been an absolute concern. So um, we've reached out directly to Pilgrims, who, who is one of the largest private employers in the community. Um, they've continued to provide some updates uh, about the state of affairs there. So they know that that eyes are on them. Uh, we've also asked the Northeast Health District to visit with them. And the Northeast Health District has in turn uh, been in contact with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who is the, the direct regulatory supervisor. Uh, but, uh, the the union has also uh, been conscious of needs of employees there, and and I think they have also been in touch with management to ensure that the kinds of distancing and the kind of employee supports that need to happen in any workplace are happening there. All right, thank you. Um, next question, my uh, Word document is frozen, so give me just a second to pull this up again. Uh, I believe the next question pertained to um, people that need to return to work right now and what they should do with regards to childcare and what they should do if they don't feel safe returning to work, even if they are now allowed to. Sure. There, um, uh, there are two things I'll offer. I mean, one is that probably for the second part of that, um, stick around for next week's program since we'll have somebody from Department of Labor. The one very specific thing that the Department of Labor has said is that if you are a caretaker for a young person, a child, or, or a senior for that matter, who has to be at home given the crisis, you can collect unemployment as a result of that life circumstance. So, you know, if your child is out of school uh, or not, not attending the physical brick and mortar school right now, um, that's rationale for collecting unemployment. If you're caring for somebody who is uh, who has a risk condition, who is over 60, the, the same circumstances in place. You can collect unemployment because you have to be a caretaker for that individual. All right, thank you. Um, Shane Jordan McBride asks, what plans are in place for the probable shutdown that will happen this fall winter during the cold and flu season? Can we as small business owners begin having these conversations now in order to shape those plans? No, I, I, you know, I, I think that's an ideal question. And that really goes to a lot of the conversation that's happening right now uh, about what the arc of the next many months is gonna look like. Um, certainly we anticipate that there is gonna be some resurgence at some point, um, whether that's a resurgence to the degree of what we're undergoing right now, uh, whether that's a more mild resurgence or whether if it's a series of hills and in the months ahead, we're trying to get some guidance on. So one of the advisory groups that we've put together 
um, is uh, an epidemiological advice group. And I'm going to be meeting with them online um, early next week, either Monday or Tuesday. And, and that's one of the questions that I'll field to that group because as as I prepared the budget, just kind of reflecting back on one of the earlier questions, I had to think, you know, what if we have to provide, you know, a significant amount of food aid or shelter aid or sanitation aid or aid to provide for people's utilities to continue to work this time next year or, or this coming winter? So th those those out months, uh, that that horizon is very much on our mind. All right. Thanks. Um, concerned citizen asks, when will hazard pay for essential county employees be implemented? Has this been discussed? Not only for first responders who are so often marginalized in this community, but for waste management, utility streets, and other essential worst workers. Please treat these employees right. Uh, absolutely. Our, our employees have been just golden mm -hmm. in, in these last couple of months um, from you know people at front desks of permitting offices to um, the folks who come down my street and pick up my recycling um, week in, week out. They've been fantastic. So right now we're crafting what that level of support looks like. I anticipate that that probably is going to be some extended paid time off for those employees. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question from my Keisha Ross is actually directed towards me and a couple other commissioners. Um, what has Patrick Davenport, Commissioner Mariah Parker, Jerry Neesmith done in the African-American community during this crisis? Um, I can't speak for uh, Commissioners Davenport and Neesmith, but what I can say for what's been happening in East Athens is um, a lot of collaboration with the East Athens Development Corporation. Um, we were able to raise about $1,000 um, two weeks ago for their emergency relief fund, which is being used to help buy food and medicine for folks and potentially looking into doing rent and utility assistance as well. Um, they've partnered with Hugh Atchison from 5 and 10 to do weekly food deliveries to, at Nelly B every Monday from about 10 to 2. As well, they do, um, I think, bi-monthly food distribution at EADC. You can drive up and get food put in your car. The next one is May 7th um, from 10 to 12. And um, I'm available if there's other initiatives I can get involved in that need help out with because, um, yeah, I'd love to help any way I can. Um, another question coming from, there's two questions coming from Jesse Poole. Um, the first, if someone experiencing homelessness doesn't have a phone and therefore also no internet, where can they go in person to get information and connect with services? I spoke with someone downtown yesterday who didn't know where to go, and I wasn't sure where to point them that it's actually open to drop-ins during this time. So I, I'd recommend to point anybody to the Homeless Day Service Center on North Avenue as a first point of entry. And then um, whether somebody has food needs or sanitation needs or shelter needs or travel needs, um, they'd be able to connect that individual with the appropriate resources. All right. And our last two questions um, relate to uh, folks in the ACC jail. The first is from Jesse Hull also. Um, what is the latest data on how many people have been released and put in the ACC jail since the shelter in place began? How many folks remain in the jail and how many have been released? What can we do to release the remaining folks held there? And I can actually answer some of that if you'd like, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. You go, go ahead and begin, uh, Commissioner Parker, and then sure. I can fill so, in. So um, as of April 28th, there were about 252 people in the jail. Um, uh, the jail staff and judges have been working to release folks by altering their bonds or sentencing. So they're able to release about 130 people from jail um, since the statewide judicial emergency order on March 14th. Um, I've been working with local activists um, and folks in the public defender's office to issue some bond release requests to judges in the next week to help get more people out. And actually, we'll be um, introducing a resolution to hopefully get the commission support for that action by next week. So I'm still working on that. But uh, Kelly, do you have anything that you wanted to add on that point? Sure. Uh, it was probably almost five weeks ago that I reached out uh, first to Judge Lott and then subsequently to T.J. Bement, who's the state's regional court administrator. Uh, and then I had a conversation on the phone with both of them and the lead superior court judge, Judge Haggard. And um, for folks just familiar with governmental operations, uh, you know, there's the concept of separation of powers. So the specific requirements around somebody who may be incarcerated sort of falls on the judicial branch. But of course, the judicial branch 
uh, is influenced by what the landscape of resources may look like. So I was very explicit in letting Judge Haggard, Judge Lott, and uh, Mr. Bement know that if it was a matter of needing of any resources, for example, should uh, the question in their mind rest on availability of monitoring or availability of personnel to do case management in the community that I would absolutely provide through our financial resources, those kind of things um, so that every individual who reasonably could be, who could be um, released would be. And so they, they took that in. And, and I think even since then, we've seen some reduction. And, and even in the last day, I think the number has fallen from, um, from the number you provided. I think it's in the 220s now. Um, just to give everybody some context, eight weeks ago, it was about 375. Um, and, and for, you know, even kind of longer term picture, 10 years ago, it was almost 550 on average per day. So um, we, we've seen a dramatic reduction. And, and I do want to note as a corollary to, to this conversation that um, we've not seen a spike in crime during the COVID pandemic. Um, if anything, we've seen a modest reduction in crime. Um, now, now, that's an overall reality. I mean, there are a couple of variations. For example, there's been a dramatic decline in residential burglaries, but there's been a slight bump in commercial burglaries. The, the bump in commercial burglaries hasn't been nearly as dramatic as the decline in residential burglaries, but, but we are not seeing a crime spike right now. And uh, we, we have reduced crime and reduced arrests today versus same point in time a year ago. Great. And then Rachel Arney um, asked many of the same questions, but an additional question. Um, for those who are not released, what measures will be taken for their safety um, against the spread of COVID-19? Uh, I'm glad to reach out to the Clark County Sheriff's Department who manages the jail, and, and we can go ahead and uh, I'll put a, a package together so that everybody understands the components we've just talked about, as well as practically what's being done on the ground day in, day out in the jail. Um, and so uh, uh, Assistant Sheriff uh, Jims Cole um, and I'll have a conversation tomorrow and I'll put out some information to provide you with knowledge of exactly what they're doing. Um, the, the jail, when it was built about a decade ago, was set up to house about 750 people. As you've just heard, they're you know somewhere south of a third of those there right now. So I'd have to imagine that at least the spatial dynamics sort of benefit us. All right. That's all the questions they had for us today. Great. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everybody who is here. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Parker. I appreciate you coming on. Um, thank you, David Bradley from the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce, Rich McClanahan from First American Bank, Tim Kelly from Rook and Pawn and the National, and Michelle Pearson from Edward Jones Advisory and the Northeast Georgia Business Alliance. You guys have been fabulous. Uh, it's been another program of community conversation. And once again, next Wednesday, this time, six to seven, we will be here with a representative from the Georgia Department of Labor. So I'm um, happy to receive all your questions through accgov.com slash mayor, where there's a, a question button. Um, but if you have particular questions about those individual employee needs, um, we want to bring those to the Department of Labor rep. So everybody, please be safe. Have a great night. Wear your masks. Stay at home. See you soon.